I'm speaking with Dr. Joseph Jaffe. Dr. Jaffe is editor and publisher of Die Zeit, which is Germany's most widely read weekly. He's considered an expert on the Middle East as well as on international security issues, and his articles have appeared in many publications, including the New York Review of Books, the New York Times Magazine, Commentary, and the Weekly Standard. He's a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University, and also the Abramowitz Fellow at the Hoover Institution. His most recent book is called Uber Power, The Imperial Temptation of America. Dr. Jaffe was raised in West Berlin during the Cold War, came to America to study, and has a PhD in government from Harvard University. And I now teach American foreign policy at Stanford. So we know that you're extremely well informed, and I'm going to ask you a lot of okay. questions about American foreign policy. Okay. But let's start with the Middle East. Yep. The Arab-Israeli conflict seems to take up a huge amount of the world's attention, even yeah. though there are lots of other conflicts yeah. going on at the same time that have much higher casualty counts. Everybody seems to be obsessed with this conflict. Why is this conflict so much more prominent? Well, I, I, I beg to differ on the, on the premise. What you just said was right for many years and decades, but I think in recent times the um, the, the so the so-called Middle East conflict, which they mean the Israeli Arab one, has almost shrunk to a sideshow. It is it is shrinking to the level where it, onto which it belongs. Why? Because the the stage on which it unfolds has become so much bigger. We are no longer talking about that narrow strip of land between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, which is what, 20 kilometers or something. The stage now goes from Beirut to, to Kandahar, from Lebanon to, to Afghanistan, uh, from, from, the Kurdish, from the Kurdish border in the north of Iraq down to the Gulf. Uh, and the real, the real interesting Middle Eastern conflicts have nothing to do uh, with the so-called Arab uh, Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict it has to do with Iranian hegemonial ambitions. It has to do with oil, a strategic resource of the first order. It has to do with a half a dozen clashes with a serious potential between states, between religions, between sects. So this is just one conflict among many? Yes. Now many people on the Arab side say that the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians is the key to everything else. Until that's solved, nothing else can be well, solved. I think it's, it's a familiar line, but uh, uh, it, I, I don't agree with that line, because uh, because I can think of a half a, as, a, as I said, a half a dozen conflicts in the neighborhood which have nothing to do with 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 Israel and the Palestinians. I think about Iran trying to extend its power. Think about the real serious wars in that neighborhood, where not between Israel and, and its neighbors. The worst war and the longest war was between Iran and Iraq in the 1980s, which claimed you know, a million or two uh, uh, casualties. But Iran is now saying that Israel is its principal enemy. It has That's Iran. no higher goal than getting rid yeah. of Israel. But this is, again, we have to distinguish between the propaganda line and, uh, and the reality. Uh, the conflict is between the Shia and the Sunni, between Iran's hegemonic ambitions and the fear uh, of the Sunni states, most of whom are quasi-American allies like Saudi Arabia. If you go back 50 or 60 years all the way, you see that there was a, the, the area was rent by myriad conflicts which have very little to do with, with, uh, with the Arab Israeli conflict. I mean, what is the, the hundred, several hundred thousand dead in Algeria, in the civil war in Algeria, have to do with Israel? Now, from the standpoint of American foreign policy, what is America's interest in all these conflicts, what does America hope to accomplish in the region for itself? Well, I give you a lot, I give you a kind of general answer. Uh, America is the global power, uh, and it naturally has to has to care about what's happening in the world. And what Europe was in the 20th century, the major arena of conflict, uh, the 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 Middle East is in the 21st century. Um, that is where the most explosive Potential is, is piled up. That's where the most num largest number of highest number of conflicts are, 
and that's where the stakes are the highest, which has to do with regional domination with strategic resources like oil. But the strategic arena of the first order where three continents are joined, um, and so naturally if you are the global power, you're going to take a great deal of interest in what's happening there. This is not Papua Guinea or, uh, or even New Zealand. Now, I know that oil is a big interest because yeah. oil is the lifeblood of the modern Correct. industrial economy, and we want to keep that flowing. Mm -hmm. But is that the only issue? Or, I mean, are there other issues driving all these conflicts? Uh, what are you driving at? Well, there's, there's several things that people are fighting for. Yeah. There's dominance, yeah. to dominate and not be dominated. Right. Uh, there are religious conflicts, right. there are territorial conflicts, right. there are a lot of things right. going on. Yeah. So I'm trying to kind of isolate all these factors and figure out the importance of each one. I don't think you can. I mean, well, some you can. I mean, look, there is some, one thing that's going on is an age-old Syrian quest for domination of Lebanon, which it calls part of greater Syria. That is one conflict. It's a, it's a semi-hegemonial conflict. Then there's a claim of Iran to run the whole neighborhood. That's a hegemonial conflict. Then there is Iran's quest for nuclear weapons, something that can potentially turn into a global conflict. Uh, then you have the civilizational conflict in Shia and Sunni, which arrays Sunni states against the dominant Shia state. Uh, what else do we want? You'll have, uh, if the Iranians get the bomb, then others will follow. The Saudis and the Egyptians will build the bomb. Uh, you have Pakistan, which is an expl explosion waiting to happen, the most dangerous country in the world, I would think. Again, uh, to come back to an earlier issue, Pakistan's uh, pathologies have very little to do with Israel, it seems to me. If Israel disappeared from the map, Pakistan would still be the most dangerous state in the neighborhood. And Iran would still be going after nuclear weapons, and Iran would still be trying to impose a Germany and try to kick out the United States. So we have a situation in the Middle East that if it truly gets out of control, could be extremely damaging to the United States. I mean, we're looking at something... World, to the world. I mean, you know, Iranian nuclear weapons aren't just... Look, Iranian nuclear weapons are not going to reach the United States uh, any, as long as all of us live. It's going to take a long time. But the Iranian nuclear weapons can destroy Israel. It can intimidate Saudi Arabia. It can intimidate Egypt. Uh, so do you think we should do anything to try to prevent Iran from getting nuclear yes. weapons? We should try to do everything to prevent uh, Iran from getting nuclear weapons because I think uh, we have to take seriously when he talks about eradicating Israel from the map. Mm -hmm. And when he talks about, and when Khomeini earlier talked about, so, so we lose 20 million people, but Israel won't exist anymore. So what Khomeini indica indicates that the normal logic of mutual deterrence, which kept the peace between the Soviet Union and America for 40 years, may not work. So we're talking about some very serious thing here. And some people have suggested that the United States, with or without uh, Israel's help, attack Iran. No. But that has problems also. If you're the one who strikes the first blow, not necessarily for the correct reasons, you could find yourself in a bigger mess than you were expecting, like in Iraq, for example. Well. I think Iraq was winning against Saddam's army was probably a cakewalk compared to the strategic tactical issues of um, destroying I Iran's nuclear capability. There's only one nation that can do it, the United States. Israel can't do it. All you have to do is to look at the map, look at the distances, and then look at what Israel has to offer to throw into the battle. For Israel to destroy Iran's, for the United States to destroy Iran's nuclear capability, can it just knock out the capability, or does it have to overthrow the whole regime? I was, I was going to get, I was going to get to this. So, anybody who thinks it's just you know kind of an afternoon worth of flying, where you know we hit uh, five, ten, twenty nuclear sites, uh, is is grievously wrong. This is a very, very serious campaign, which would have to consist of at least four parts, and we're talking about major, major war. The first wave would have to take out Iranian air defenses. The second wave would have to take out all of its naval assets on the Gulf with which it could threaten oil traffic in the, in the, in the Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. Um, 
then you would want to take out all the refining capabilities. Uh, as you know, they import about half of their refined products from abroad. So you want to take out the rest to, to, to make sure that the Iranian economy grinds to a halt tomorrow. And then finally, you want to attack a lot of targets, some of whom we don't know where they're located, some of whom are located in densely populated neighborhoods. So we're talking about a very major campaign which would involve 1,000 planes and more. So it's not, you know, like what the Israelis did in 81, you know, just hit one reactor and go back, uh, which has, as you, your, 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 your question indicated, has is fraught with a lot of, lot of risks. I mean, when the bombing started,